What's up everyone? It's me Rahul and I'm not on my usual computer today because I am in Sydney, Australia on the way to Perth to play a regionals. So I figured now that I've gotten settled in, spent the whole day exploring and I'm back in my hotel room for the night. I have a little bit of energy left in my system so I was like, let's do a EUIC tournament report. A little bit like an old school one. I know I used to watch a lot of these deck profiles that used to have the deck in them and I get to talk about the matchups and everything here. I have everything pulled up here on my trusty iPad, my RK9 Labs page. Uh, who I played against and everything so I can break through my EYC performance. And I know you guys have been dying to hear about the Bennett idea in the Giratina deck that our group came up with, mainly Isaiah came up with and how the idea came to be. So uh, if you guys didn't know, I played Giratina Lost Zone uh, with Bennett in there, a 2-1-1 Bennett line. Um, the idea kind of came about because we were leading up to this event, we were kind of testing everything uh, almost a month out, I think. Um, as soon as the Japanese tournament happened in Fukuoka, we started testing lists, testing ideas, seeing if Lugia had any merit, seeing what decks we liked, what we didn't like. So stuff started getting ruled out pretty early on in the process. Um, we knew that Zard would be very important to try to take down throughout the tournament. And we thought that Seapow would also be a very important deck. And we were correct on both fronts as the two decks were the number one and two decks in the tournament. And both decks were the two highest placing decks in day two. We wanted to not lose to control. So a deck like Giratina has a lot of outs in the control and something like Binet kind of shores up the matchup. Um, so going into exactly what the Bennett did, uh, a lot of people are misconceiving that if you go up against Sea Power or something, you just go into the turn two Bennett lock and all of a sudden your opponent can't play the game. That's just not true. Um, you, if you just turn to do 30 to them and lock their board, they can just attach five times and blow up your active. And if you don't have another shuffle on board, you can't establish it again. And let's say you do get that anyway, then you just kind of high rolled into that position. Um, and your deck just doesn't have a great way to get the turn two Bennett in a lot of situations. So it's just like, you don't have to go for it. So against something like Chin Pal, whether you go first or whether you go second, you just kind of go set up your board as you normally would. Go into one mana fee, one shop it on board, set up your Giratina into the active, Abyss Seeking a lot of the time. And if they choose to attack um, your board with Prime Catcher, Cologne on uh, mana fee, take out the shop it and the uh, mana fee, you can go ahead and shred the active with Giratina and you can go ahead and reset up the two pieces on the bench. They then have no Prime Catcher to work with and a lot of lists were not playing boss. So then they have to knock out the active and if they knock out the active, they've now used at least a minimum of four energy. And once they use four energy, well, the situation's so much easier to win the game because you know they don't have five energy to knock out Bennett because most lists are only playing eight water energy. So from there, it just becomes a super easy game of, I have Bennett, I'm gonna boss things around, I'm gonna lock stuff. And then on, on one turn, I'm just gonna fell soup, get your energy off the board and use Sableye to um, get rid of your board. And also you don't item lock forever also as Bennett. Uh, let's say you do go first and get the turn to item lock because you high rolled a little bit. You just item lock a little bit until you can kind of save their board uh, in a position where they just don't have any answers to respond. Like same thing with Zard. Like let's say you go first and you have the Hail Mary use Bennett early. It's not the worst thing in the world to force them to find that Charmeleon because let's say they didn't get it they didn't get a Rotom on turn one, or they didn't get their Seal Stone on turn one. Um, it's higher likely that they'll find the Seal Stone at some point, but they might not find the Rotom on, uh, at some point because they don't have Nest Balls uh, to work with. Um, so they can't Arvin for it directly. So at that point, you can kind of like buy some time, try to take out a Tremon in the active. Maybe they have to give you like a Pidgey or they have to give you a Mana Fee or something. You get that free prize as well. Now you're up two prizes. So the game is kind of already back in your court. And if you can stall long enough to get to Sableye, which you oftentimes won't because if they can get the one Charmeleon, your Bennett's already being given up as a two prizer. You can still establish your board, find some pieces, get to that iron leaves as easily as possible and go from there. So let's go through the deck list first. Four Comfy, and it's pretty standard in a Tina deck. Um, three V-Star and three Tina V. I think that's super, super standard in a Tina deck. I don't think like you can really break pattern. We had the two, one, one Bennett line. I use the Halloween trick or treat cards because it's optimal. A uh, little Bennett is actually pretty insane because a lot of the time you can go from four to 10 or even like one to seven in the same turn, which is really important if you have a bad turn one. Um, so you can race a couple decks to get to your Shred turn. You can get to your Lost Impact turn pretty easily. Uh, you can get to a Star Requiem turn out of nowhere, a Sableye turn out of nowhere. This card was actually really, really good across the tournament. And the fact that these two stage ones come from the same basic is absolutely ludicrous. Like I feel like Isaiah said it best in his interview. Um, this is what the card designers wanted or envisioned when they thought Bennett was gonna be played this way. Um, and Poltergeist was actually a really good attack across the day too. A lot of people did use it in our group to win their individual games. You need Banafee for Mirror Match because we're not playing Waters. You need it for Lost Box Turbo because we don't have a way to deal with Greninja realistically. Any deck that can Greninja us, you really, really need this because if not, we're gonna fall really far behind. Greninja is the best Radiant to draw cards and figure stuff out. There was a portion, a position of time where I was considering Greninja, uh, cutting Greninja, and we like talked about it briefly just because like, I don't know, he wasn't really doing a lot in testing, but at the same time, it's like, 
you need it when you need it. And you need to find a way to put energies in the discard, especially if they're stuck in your hand. So you can super add them back and use gate. And so that was one of the biggest reasons we had to keep this guy. There also wasn't any like better options to be fair. Uh, Cramorant is a staple of any lost box deck. You just want to have one. I think two could be reasonably justified as well, but I think one makes a lot of sense. Uh, one off Sableye as well. Little guy is good for lost mining, closing out games. And then I had my sick looking art of Iron Leaves. You guys saw me on stream. Um, Iron Leaves is really good for the Charizard matchup, and I guess Roaring Moon as well. It's a good attack rate, hits for 180, can power itself up through the board with Mirage Gates, and it's just overall really strong at closing out the Charizard matchup. Um, four colors. Uh, as opposed to traditionalists, we chose to only play one boss, but we had to make space somewhere, and I guess the baby that counts as a VS Seeker technically, so we have two boss technically if we need it. It just really sucked if we had a loss and a boss. Same with Roxanne, we only had one Roxanne. But a lot of the time, it's just like people didn't really know our account, so they couldn't really play around the fact that we only had one boss, one Roxanne. That obviously is going to change now that the cat is out of the bag. Um, so people are going to play diff differently, knowing that, like, oh, they actually do have two boss. Oh, they actually do... Oh, actually, they only have one boss or only one Roxanne. Um, so, again, something's going to have to change about the list moving forward, because list knowledge is important with stuff like Giratina. Four Mirage Gate is pretty staple in the deck. We had four copies of Nest Ball as well. I think Nest Ball is more important, because you need to find early Tinas. Um and things like Sableye and Cram and those cards just can't be found with Poffin, so Poffin has a lot less value in this deck. We only have three copies of Switches or Switching cards. Um, normally, your team must have four, maybe five cards that are Switching cards, so it felt a little bit weird only having three Switching cards, and I think that did hurt me across the tournament, but the Binets were a worthy um, inclusion otherwise. Only two Buddy Buddy Poffins, because the only things that get value out of these are Comfy and Shuppet, which I think adding Shuppet does make these cards more valuable, but... Um, besides like the turn one Poffins usually hit the lost bin anyway. So it didn't really feel that terrible, you know, only playing two. Two copies of Super Odd, I think that's very staple in the Giratina list. I obviously wanted a third a lot of the time, but that's just because I kept lost hunting one. Uh, we had a Prime Catcher and a Counter Catcher. Counter Catcher just to have a play you could make with Roxanne in the same turn, or uh, Chorus just to dig deeper, and then Prime Catcher is like a similar effect, but also you get to use a Comfy if you need to, uh, and keep playing from there. One copy of Sealstone. It's not ideal because you don't want to really use Star Requiem as much, but there's less matchups you need to Star Requiem in. Like, you don't need to Star Requiem in. There's a, like, big Mew thing. Like, a lot of things just die to Lost Impact now. So you just don't really need um, to use your V-Star later on in the game, uh, which is just good for that. One copy of Gear. Um, just <laughs> just a fifth chorus, I guess. Uh, or, like, to find the whatever we need that turn. A Sinnoh and an Artisan. The Artisan, I think, is just staple to have a standard consistency card because we only have two Poffins, so it makes a lot of sense. The Sinnoh didn't really do too much for us, but the idea was that random decks would play Mist Energy, like Arceus decks, and Zard decks, so to have it in those situations, it would be really clutch to be able to be start through the Mist. Um, especially Control, it kind of came to clutch as well. Um, but the big thing also was that uh, Lugia, it gave us a fighting chance. <laughs> we didn't really have a great matchup in Lugia, but if you were able to Sinnoh... Kale, their active Roxanne, a lot of the time maybe they would break and not find that boss on that final turn they needed it. A lot of the time they're just looking for a boss to end the game because they're going to be so far ahead, so you just have to make sure so they'll find the boss. And finally, we had one copy of Ultra Ball in our item section because this was just like a way to find the Verizian, or Leave, sorry, or a Binette, or a Tina, or something, and it was just a good card overall throughout the tournament. Uh, so now we have all this complicated stuff, so we decided to cut the water, so we have five Psychic. Uh, we had four grass, just making it easier for us to play the game. Like, if there's waters involved, we have now a whole new game plan. Our deck is more inconsistent. It just feels like we're working with a lot more that we don't really want to. And I have four jets right here. Broken guard. Um, so that's the list. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Obviously, I think moving forward, the list has to change in some capacity. I think people are going to have to either realize that Jirachi is going to make it into more lists because Tina did well, and obviously people are recency biased. Um, the Zard matchup, Tord matchup with the Barrel isn't necessarily that great because they have a Barrel and Pidgeot, so we can't really eliminate their one big draw engine off the board. Um, c players might know a little bit better how to play into Binet now. I don't think that matters too much, honestly. If they high roll you, they high roll you. If they don't, they don't. Um, and if, I mean, Lugia, I don't expect to be more popular, but stuff like Hands and stuff could pick up more popularity, and Moon is a little bit of a worse matchup than we realized, obviously. So it's like, that could pick up popularity as well. So that being said, let's jump into my tournament report. Um, round one, I played against Rebecca, Rebecca Hallowell from the UK. She was playing Arceus Giratina. At game one, she gets off to a blistering start. Um, and I end up like putting her in a position where she never establishes the barrel. So her board is just like an Arceus and a Giratina, and I get the prime catcher playoff on the Giratina. And I'm able to take that out. She has to hit into my uh, Giratina. I'm able to take out her Arceus um, because I crammed into it earlier. Uh, she has Radiant Guardi down. She prioritizes getting that into play. So I have, I have to V-star the uh, Tina. And then I have to take out the Arc um, 
with Lost Impact, and she's trying to set up a third Arceus, but obviously at this point in time, I've now gotten into a position where I've stabilized, so the third Arceus just never gets set up and I win the game. Uh, something similar happens in game two where she goes Arc, Arc, Tina, um, and so I have to go cram into the active Arc. She hits into my cram. I have Counter Catcher this time, so we have Counter Catcher, V Star, the, um, um, Tina, uh, the Tina on the bench. So I take out the Tina. Sorry, I think I knocked my phone down a little bit. So I knock out the Tina, um, and then she goes, hits me with Arc, and then I boss the baby Arceus, set up a new Tina, I knock out the active, and now she has two prizes to, I have two prizes remaining, and she has damaged Arceus in the active, and she can't really establish a new attacker. She does get a bit about this game with Radzard, but at this point, it's like effectively checkmate because the board is just too good. So that's kind of where the problem of Arc comes in, where they're gonna judge you a bunch of times, and if you can get out of it, you can get out of it. And I had Bennett, but I got the baby Bennett in play game two, especially a game one I couldn't, I was like struggling a little bit, but game two, I got the Bennett into play, the baby Bennett. And so it was like super easy for me to just, you know, play my way out of that situation. Um, round two, I played against Grant Naffy, who's playing Zard. I think he's very, looks very similar to Tord. And both games, Grant kind of struggled to set up a little bit. Um, like he found turn one Poffin, like double Poffin basically. Uh, and as soon as he did that, I was like, oh, that's kind of scary but then after that he just never established a board like he didn't get to pitch out fast enough he wasn't able to get to where he needed to be so game one i just kind of we got to a like a late game situation where like after i leaves he was able to go roxanne kill my active with zard radiant zard and i had to find um i think gust to win maybe but i think what i had to do that turn is like i crammed it um and then he went into he had a zard on board that he couldn't remove because uh, I think he already used his collapsed. So after I crammed it, he wasn't able to find a pivot option because he had, didn't have pigeon on play. And then the next turn I found um, boss for game. Um, so that was super lucky for me. And then game two, he just kind of like, bricked and I was able to take that. So now I'm 2-0 in the tournament. Run through against Tyler Vaughn, who's playing C. Pow. And both games went almost identical uh, where he was not really able to remove my shuffle off the board. And he had to like dump four or five energies to take out my Tina. And as soon as that happened, I went into Binette. And then he would like start attaching energies to try to one shot me um but obviously he'd be short every single time so then i would just wherever the energies were i would like boss up the bib attack it and so now if you're going to commit energies to bib uh you lose the game if you don't have to attach energies to bib this guy just goes down then i would counter catch up the backs hit that as well and then i basically just did that rinse and repeat uh never i never did backs first because the 130 damage could actually swing the game um if he had enough energies but uh, so i did the bib first so it's like okay i can take out the bib I go from there. So Tyler basically like walked into my trap as the first CPAP player, and I was able to take a 2 0 victory. Round four, I go against Peter, uh, Piotr Olienski. Um, he's playing Lost Box Turbo, and game one comes out to a board state where I have a Tina in the active with two energies. I have to V Star um, to go down to one prize. He now has access to um, get like Roaring Moon on, on board and just like pop me or, or DM Crisis Punch, and I know he plays both of those cards. Um, but I have to make a decision, like a gut check, where I'm like, is it easier that he finds this, or he finds a Sableye plus energy and knocks out a Sableye on my board? Um, if I if I get the Sableye out preemptively, so I just rock sand without putting the Sableye into play, and I draw into Nest Ball Gate, and I'm like, sick. I think I have game, no matter what happens, if I don't lose this upcoming turn. And I V Star the active, whatever it was, I don't remember, I think it was a Hoopa. Um, and then he has to find all these pieces, and he doesn't, so I end up just finding Sableye. I think he crams into my active, and I find Sableye for game. I think I had to take two prizes, sorry. So the TM, I knew the TM wasn't on, but I had exhausted his switch cards, and he had Sableye's, he had stuff on board with damage with it. I think I crammed into a Greninja early, and the Greninja's been sticking around. So I just win the game if I just get to get the Sableye, and I did, which was super awesome. Um, game two, uh, the table's turn. We get to a board decision again where I'm just dominating. His TM crisis punch is gone. He has not really found a ton of resources. He's down three switch, three switch cards, three gate, like basically everything. Tons of mess balls left. Um, and so I go Chorus to, or Roxanne, Roxanne to two, kill active with Cram. My board is now Cram with an energy and two teen of V-Stars fully powered up with three energy. And I have the Seal Sun on board too, and I haven't popped the V-Star yet. So I'm just in a really dominating position and I need him not to find off of his Roxanne to two, basically Moon, Gate, Attach, Boss. And I'm like, well, you have a Greninja. I know you rotted back six energies and you have a Comfy with a board. So you have a couple of ways to pivot and move through your deck. He draws his two, draws her third. He goes Nest Ball the Moon, gate two energies to it first, which I don't know if it's correct or not. He does the first flower selecting. He excitedly puts a card in there. I don't even remember what it was, but he attaches dark and just shows me the boss. And I'm like, that's sick. And this is when it turns. So if that doesn't happen, I just win next turn and the set ends and we just 
whatever. So because he, it was in turns and he beat me in game two, that way we ended up tying, which was like a little bit frustrating because I feel like the Roxanne should stick, you know? Um, so that was pretty unfortunate. And then I go up against George uh, Giannolidis uh, from Greece, and he ended up finishing top 16, I believe. So really uh, congrats to him in round five. Uh, he played Charizard as well. And both games kind of came down to just like, he would area me and he like just didn't hit anything that he needed. And I just would go into like aggressive mode and like pop stuff and do things uh, into the Zard matchup. And I feel like I um, like kind of, there was like one turn, one time I didn't get to play around the area super well, but it didn't matter because I just didn't find good cards and put them in my hand. And game two, I just like aggressively raced to seven as fast as I could. So I could just gate energies onto my board and it didn't matter like if he had an area or not. Like I was just like, I'm just gonna put energies on my board. Um, and then I'm gonna play with the energies on my board because I think I win because of my head. Um, and that's what, that's what happened. So now I'm 401, I'm locked in for points, uh, which is whatever, it's like a small uh, victory in my book. I'd like to day two at the very least, I'd like to try to do something with my tournament. I hit Pedro Eugenio Torres, someone who's been very good at ICs across the board, playing Lost Box Turbo with a bunch of fun stuff. And Pedro isn't necessarily the fastest player, so I knew that we were only probably gonna play one game, um, whether I liked it or not. And game one comes down to the wire where Pedro, all he has to do in my opinion, all he has to do, like I end up missing a switch card, early on, or I miss, I, sorry, I miss a V-Star early on to knock out like his Raikou, um, which then puts me on the back foot immediately. And so now I'm in a position where I have to like find my way back into the game. And all he has to do is to keep tempo is retreat his melee X into uh, Cram and Cram knock out my Cram that I killed his Raikou with and the board's back in his favor. But he uses melee X for some reason to copy my Cram and kill it. And I think he just doesn't think I have a way to win the game from there. But if I can find my Iron Leaves, I can Iron Leaves, which does 180 exactly, take those two prizes, go down to one prize, he has to take three prizes, and then I basically have checkmate on board the next turn. Don't need a Gust, don't need anything. Um, I end up doing a Chorus, I end up doing a Flower Selecting, I end up doing a second Flower Selecting, and I think I had a Greninja on board as well, and I end up having two Super Rods in my bottom four cards, and it's kind of a problem because I did have a lot of Grass Energy in my hand that I needed to get rid of with the Greninja, and that's the only way I could gate. Like, the only way I could gate that turn was if I could get the rod to put the energies back in the deck. Um, and because of that, I whiffed that attack that turn and that cost me the game and we just don't ever finish a game two. So now we go into round seven. I'm at 411, I play against Mike Diaz. He's playing an interesting version of Lost Box, uh, also turbo, but he's playing uh, heavier lightning energies and he's got like a Raikou. He's got a Raikou V, he's got um, a Rotom V, he's got, um, uh, he played Ride on EX, which has Tandem Unit, so he can Tandem Unit out the hands. So it's like a really cool combo where you go Nest Ball for the Tandem Unit, Tandem Unit gets you ha hands and Rotom, or like hands and Raikou, and now you have a Seal Stone target, plus you have a hands that's powered up, and Maradon does 220, which is a really good number in this format. Um, I don't know if he played a modifier, I don't remember, but if he did, it like kind of just plays into that as well. So it's a little bit more of an aggressive, I am a Lightning type deck, um, so I can just out-trade the decks like Lugia that are supposed to out-trade you. Um, and you have hands early into like other attackers. So game one, he just kind of rolls me. Like I have a pretty slow start, but I stick out the game because I just want to see what's in his deck. And he gets like turn one Raikou into like turn two hands. Uh, and then like turn three, he gets like the energies on Rhydon and like dust up my guy and pops it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool, pack it up. Game two, he has like a super slow start. And I think by like turn three, he packs it up as well. Um, and then game three, he goes Sableye attach pass uh, going second. So I'm just able to, again, and I was forced to go first, right? So I just go, um, like, comfy, 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 go, basically, like, aggressively trying to get to 7. So if even he produces an attacker, I can go 7 with Tina 280, or I can try to get to 10, because I got the Shuppet in play, and I had the Bonnet, bonnet in hand. Um, so I was looking to get the 1, 2, 3, sh uh, Chorus to 8, Shuppet pop, try to save on turn 2, if I could. Um, or try to just, like, set up a uh, V-Star on turn 2 on, like, a 2-prizer, if I possibly could. Um, cause my hand was insane. I had like prime catcher and stuff too, but he just went sable I attached pass and I was like, yeah, I can get there. And I just went through the motions. I found the, um, uh, cram and I just knocked him out. So now I am at five one one. I have to win one of my next two to move on to day two. I go up against Miloslav playing Charizard. He's got some text for me though. He's got the mist energy. He's got the collapsed. He has the, um, draw cheap. So it's kind of annoying for me to play the game. Game one, um, I kind of make a mistake and I walk into an area that I shouldn't have walked into. I should have been more aggressive early on and just started taking prizes, but I was like playing a super slow game, which walked into his area strategy and I ended up being like one attack short of winning the game because I didn't have the resources to do it, which was super frustrating. And then game two, I don't make that mistake and I just kind of take it. And then game three, um, he's super breaking and time gets called. Um, 
And I basically was like, dude, you know, Ted doesn't help either of us here. We're just going for making day two and going further from there. And he's a friend of mine, so I think a gentleman's was in order there. And obviously, it should have, should have happened before the... Like, we had discussed it briefly before the game began. So, a little bit on me. And then he was just like, okay, I agree. I am breaking. You have it. And I was like, cool. Thank you. Because um, I think, like, it, had the game continued, I think I was up, like, three prizes already. And he was just, like, had a bunch of guys on board with Poffin. But I wasn't able to take my remaining three prizes in the um, allotted time. So, now I'm 6-1 and moved on to day two. I go up against Tapio Ikonen from Finland. I played him last year at EUSC as well. So it's kind of like a flash from the past, um, playing him back-to-back -back years in a field of this many people. And he's playing Lugia. So we're both locked into day two, so we're a little bit less stressed about, you know, our tournament result, whatever. Game one, he just kind of rolls me. Like, he has, like, Lugia attached pass, basically, turn one. I'm like, sick. Do my whole turn, a bit seeking, you know. I think your start's pretty slow. It's really hard for me to get two Lugia, or, like, double r caps into the discard while going into... Um, like their second turn with nothing, they didn't do anything turn one. Nope, uh, just cursed myself. He immediately gets in like Ultra Ball, Double Archeops, um, Research, finds the V-Star, V-Star into Thing, uh, Double Chinchino on board, knock out my active. I'm getting rolled game one. I just stick it out to see what's in the deck. As soon as the deck game two, he has like a super bricky start and he just gets one Lugia off of Call for Family. Uh, he gets like Double Chinchino, uh, or Minchino Lugia. And I have Prime Catcher, so I go Prime Catcher 280, like turn two, I think, on his um, Lugia, lone Lugia. And then he hits me for 140 and I'm like, okay, interesting decision. And he benches another Lugia this turn, but he didn't, he didn't do it the turn prior, which I think he should have just benched it. So maybe he had like a fish in hand or something that he had to use. So I just go into a different Lugia with jet energy or a different Tina with jet energy, I boss up the guy again, because I just have a boss in hand. I just have it like that uh, with my one gust list basically. Uh, boss it up and I just V-star it. Because I'm just like, okay, I think like, because he, he put a gift on it and he had like a three card hand. I was like, whatever, I'm just going to start. I think I'm going down to two prizes. I think this game is unlosable. I can just go cram, cram, basically to end the game. Uh, he hits me for 140 again. No Lugia this turn. I just go cram, switch, kill the active, and he packs it up. So now we go into game three. Um, he gets a pretty good setup board. Um, he gets to turn two double arc gaps, whatever. I managed to respond with uh, 280 into a... Lugia with V Guard and Mist because I had the stadium. And instead of bumping it, he chooses to go for a different line where he promotes to Chinchino. And he kills me with Chinchino because I think he he's his logic was if I leave your clean clean Tina, even if I want even if I hit into you, I might not be able to win the game because now you have access to V Star. And I think he was down two Mist at this point in time, and he had discarded two min the big guy, Chinchino on turn one with research. Um, so it was like a pretty bad research for him. And I was like, okay, he has one mist left. And so he kills me with Chinchino. I go into um, Cram Rant. I Cram Rant kill it. He ends up going Lugia, bump my stadium, but he doesn't put another mist on the active. So I'm able to just go V Star, rod back my Cram Rant, nest ball for Cram Rant. And I basically set up Checkmate, I think. Because his, like, he, and then he, like, um, bosses my bench. Tina takes two prizes just to go out on, like, a. Like, I'll, I only have one prize left kind of game. And he shows me that his third mist was prize. So if he had the third mist, he can set that up. I can't V-star the active. Um, but he didn't have another V-guard, so it didn't matter. So I could just 280 it. Um, but if he, like, again, he could have just put himself in a position. Um, yeah. So now I'm 7-1-1. And I am in a good position for day two. Uh, come back day two. Feeling pretty good. I go up against Ufe, who ends up top eighting the event eventually with his turbo hands deck. Game one is like a back and forth rigor rigmarole. And it ends up putting, my, like, there's like a position in the game where I, like, think I just can't really lose and he ends up like finding the perfect pieces to um like counter catcher uh like pop my Tina on the bench and I was like okay this is really unfortunate um which I think like I just played a little bit poorly and I probably shouldn't have a bit seeking in a certain turn um which like I got punished for game two I just roll him Game three, I feel like it's over. Like, there's no way I can lose this game. I just, I'm just in a, such a good position. I just rocks in him to two. All he has on board is three crowns, one with a tool, a Mew on board. Um, no hands, nothing. Uh, and the only way he wins is if he gets hands, boss my Tina, basically. And literally, off his two rocks in, he goes, um, Arvin, get uh, hands, generator, or no, no, not Arvin, sorry, he, he just puts the hands down raw, he has generator off that, he generator hits two, which is crazy, attaches two, draws three with Mew, gets energy, tool, prime catcher, 
uh, to knock out my um, teen of you on the bench, which I had to put down because I didn't have a way to take two prizes the following turn if I didn't do that. So it's like I have to like put a teen of you down this turn to make it a V-star next turn to take two prize cards. And I was just like, dude, there's no way that just happened. So it was really frustrating because I feel like I kind of threw game one a little bit and then I got punished game three. Um, round 11, I go up against Kiko. Uh, and Kiko's playing CPOW in both games. I just locked him pretty early on, uh, and he just lost. Like, game two even, like, I got the turn two lock. I just had all the pieces in hand, and he was down four energy, and he just, like, scooped up immediately because he understood. So now I'm 1-1 one, one on the day. 8-2-1. Um, I have to go 4-0 from here to make top eight. Doable, right? So I go up against Michael Cornwall. He's also playing CPOW. Um, Michael is... Basically gets a, a pretty, pretty quick game one on me, pretty convincing game one, just because I don't really get to set up and Bennett is in my last two prize cards. So I'm playing for that Bennett uh, to come out of the prize cards because I feel like at any point in the game, if I am able to get to the Bennett, I win the game. And then games two and three, I do get to the Bennett pretty early. Um, game three, Michael did end up prizing both his back Excalibur, so he packed it up pretty early. Um, my, heart, my start was like super, super good, but he did prize back, both back Excalibur. So he like eared it and he was like, yeah, you got it. And I was like, what? And he's like, I prized two backs. And I was like, oh, that's so unfortunate. So now I'm 9-2-1. I'm feeling pretty good, feeling on top of the world. I have three more rounds. I can make the most of it. I can do better than last year's UIC. All these thoughts are going into my head. Isaiah's doing well. I'm doing well. Um, you know, we could both be in top eight, basically, is what I'm thinking. Uh, I go up against Luke Kirkham. They take me up on stream. Luke is playing Turbo Roaring Moon like it's last format. And I absolutely, absolutely get fisted. Like, there is no question about it. I did draw poorly. I was going for certain lines. I just never saw those lines. That one moon basically just, like, ran through my whole board. I just didn't get to do anything. That's a feels bad. That was like a turbo feels bad. So uh, I ended up losing that one. I get rushed off stream pretty much because uh, we did delay. So they were just waiting on me. Everyone's sitting down for the next round, basically. I get rushed to my table. I go up against Matthias uh, Matricardi playing uh, Ancient Box. And both games, I got to out, but the game, both games came down to like, um, I needed one more attack to win uh, effectively. And he just needed to whiff like a gusting effect, I think, both games. And, but his deck was like, I don't know, like six cards. So game one, he just went, show me, show you Prime Catcher. And I was like, cool, you got it. And then game two, he went, pal pad, one back. Off the rocks, and he went like, pal pad, one back, gear, gear, boss, boss game. And I was like, yep, you got it. Um, so I think it's winnable. It's just like both games, he just got off to a pretty hot start, found his poker stuff. I didn't really have a good stadium to bump it. Like, I think I got, I had to get rid of like an artisan off of an early um, selecting both games where I was just like, I don't really want to give you artisan early. It doesn't make any sense for me to do that because if I give you the early attackers, you can just side it to them because um, it's the hardest part of that deck, finding the attackers. And I was like, I just don't want to give you this. Um, and he played Prime Catcher over Drum, which gave him a little bit of a better edge into me because most of us play Awakening Drum. Um, so yeah. Uh, now I have to win the last one to potentially get money, potentially get 64. And if I knew what I knew, I would just offer the ID to Leandro. So I hit Leandro in round 15. Uh, if we just tied, we both would have made 128 over me making one or 256, which kind of sucked. Uh, Leo just playing Lost Box Turbo game one. He basically just turbo rolls me. I like kind of low roll a little bit, can't really combate, compete. I think I'm down like three prizes before the game even begins. Um, so I'm just in a tough spot. I just play a little bit so I can see what's in his deck. I prize Manaphy and he gets a green draw off too, so it's like super unfortunate. Game two, he just like actually breaks completely. I think I just donk him. Um, and then game three, we are having a little bit of a back and forth. His starts like super good actually. And then I do like my first chorus, and I think my chorus was unironically just like. It was three Psychic, two Grass. I was just like, dude, look at this. And I just showed him, like, my Chorus. And we both, like, had a little bit of a laugh. Because, like, what are you doing in that situation? Like, you can't do anything but laugh. Because that's, like, one of the worst courses you can see. And I think when I did my price check, I did write down that one Grass, one Psychic were prized two. So I was like, how is this even possible, man? Like, I prized two energy. I have to lost some two energy. I'm working with, like, so little. Like, so any loss impact I do now is, like, way worse for me throughout the game. Um, and then I think um, his, his start was just, like too good for me to handle. I think I whiffed an attack somewhere. Um, and like the wheels just kind of came off at the very end and I just couldn't close that one out. Um, so I ended up losing again. So an 0-3 finish to wrap up my day, which is super frustrating, honestly. Um, I know I could have played better a little bit in those games for sure, but I do feel like a little bit was also out of my hands. Um, uh, most of my opponents did pretty well. I had some some tough, tough opponents throughout the day, honestly. Um, so I'm pretty glad that, you know, I was able to convert, I think, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 of my uh, 15 opponents were in day 2, which is something, like, saying something, because, like, that is, like, at least that's a, a hard number to deal with. Um, yeah, that being said, you know, it was an awesome time. Um, playing UIC as always. Uh, I'm 
I don't know what I'm gonna play for Perth yet. I, I mean, I've just been enjoying Sydney for what it has been. I leave for Perth tomorrow night. Um, so once I get to Perth, I will have a full day to figure out what deck I wanna play. And I have to figure that out pretty quickly, I guess, honestly, which is a little bit of a, a little bit of a spooky situation for me. But I do think it'll be a different vibe. I think I've already got a lot of experience in this format. And hopefully I just continue to play the way I've been playing. And thank you all for the support. It was an awesome weekend. The vlog should be up soon too. So please like and subscribe. I appreciate you guys a ton for my scuffed deck profile and tournament report. Love you guys. Thank you.